Thank you very much, Pam. Um, you know, we've heard a lot today about how we're preparing to prevent damage, destruction of cultural property. And that, of course, is the ideal scenario. Whether it's our own cultural property or whether it's cultural property which is of outstanding significance, global significance. But we have to accept also that there are occasions when we simply can't do that. We can't protect it. We're not able to protect it. And this situation, of course, most recently arose in 2014-15, uh, when ISIS spread over the Middle East like a virus. And we had to watch Hartley as site after site, monument after monument, is devastated. And we could only watch. There was that recognition, even then, that we couldn't do anything on the ground to prevent it. We had to grit our teeth. And I well remember, at the British Museum, on a daily basis, taking phone calls from all manner of people, saying, what are you doing about this? What can we do? How can we stop this? Well, I did think about deploying the British Museum militia, uh, but I was not able to. It wasn't in my gift. It, I mean, a fine body of men and women that they are. Um, we really couldn't do anything. And we saw at a site like Nineveh what happened to people that did try to stand in front of the walls of Nineveh. They were beheaded. And all of the members of their family that attended the funeral were rounded up and have not been seen since. That's what happens to people who try to prevent damage to cultural property on the ground in these sorts of circumstances. So I kind of asked myself, well, what on earth can we do? There must be something we can do. And I had an idea. And it, the title of this talk, Preparing for the Aftermath. We would have to grin and bear it for a while. But then, why not offer training to our colleagues in Iraq, the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, so that they could confront that devastation, could confront the aftermath, and know exactly what to do from day one. And so I took this idea of a, a, a training program to uh, our then director, Neil McGregor, who was quite taken with the idea, and together we set off to DCMS, and they were taken with the idea too. And so they very generously, after a certain amount of, you can imagine, going back and support, uh, gave uh, us um, the sum of three million pounds. And it, well, the scheme that developed became the pilot for what has become known now as the cultural protection. So, in essence, just to remind you, and I don't want to dwell on this, but this is the sort of thing, you, you remember these awful pictures. You remember being as upset, I'm sure, as I was at the time, and feeling absolutely impotent. And so, armed with three million pounds and putting various things into place, we saw the development of the Iraq Emergency Heritage Management Training Scheme. That's an awful mouthful. And actually, you're jolly lucky I got those words in the right order. I don't use them. So, from now on, it's just the Iraq scheme. So what does it do? What do we do with our colleagues in Iraq? Well, to start with, we don't do anything to them. We actually ask them what they want. This is a thorough cooperation with the State Board of Antiquities. We ask them what skills they need, and we strive to provide them. And we're, te we're talking about sophisticated techniques of rescue and retrieval, archaeology, documentation, stabilization of sites that have been very badly destroyed. So it's a field work uh, operation. And in a way, like any other archaeological destruction, an ISIS destruction is much the same. You have to understand what you're left with before you can possibly move on to talk about reconstruction or redevelopment of these sites. And so that, in a nutshell, is what we're teaching. So how does it work? Well, we take three months in the year, we bring over six to eight participants at a time, and these are uh, agreed between ourselves and the Iraqi State Board, who they're going to be, 
and we bring them to the British Museum and we train them, if you like, classroom style for that three month period. And we teach them as much as we possibly can. Then from there, I took on two senior archaeologists to run the program, John McGuinness there, uh, I'll come back to him in a moment, and Sebastian Ray, who is missing from that photograph, oh no, not in, on the other side, on the right-hand side behind the lady with the scarf. <coughs> Sebastian Ray and John McGuinness, the two senior uh, archaeologists uh, taken on for the scheme. So, Photography obviously is terribly important. We teach them not only object photography, which you see here, but also monument photography and site photography. We provide them, I mean, thanks to that government money, we provide them with pretty high-end cameras uh, and lenses, which they are uh, allowed to keep. They take them back to Iraq and put them into practice in the field there. Uh, and so, indeed, do we give them laptop computers as well to put all the software Photoshop and whatever on those uh, machines. Technical drawing, recording of various uh, various sorts. We teach them again classroom style here. I think they're learning to do object drawing at this point. Surveying, of course, one of the most important vital aspects of any training program. We train them on something called a multi-station. Some of you may not know about a multi-station, but it's a bit like a total station, <laughs> uh, but, but better. A total station is a very uh, sophisticated bit of surveying kit. Uh, multi-station multi does it in 3D if you need it to. And it's a remarkable instrument that you can basically set up in a room like this, set it to go, and it will come back with a 3D image of this, of this room fully plotted. And we have provided now three of these machines and donated them to the State Board of Antiquities for further use in Iraq when the training program is over. I should say, by the way, that the, uh, the money that we got from the government was to provide for uh, four years of training, by which time we hoped, well, and I can tell you now we've succeeded, in training 50 professionals from the State Board. We teach them about satellite imagery, uh, geomatics, in other words, GIS, GPS. Uh, these sorts of um, uh, techniques are very important uh, to what we do. Geophysical remote sensing, uh, another uh, item in the toolkit, if you see what I mean. Uh, we've recently added uh, drone uh, technology to the program as well. But above all, we teach them excavation methodology, stratigraphic excavation, how to record uh, your work in the field in 3D through plans, sections of uh, the sort that you see there, use of recording sheets, data sheets, uh, the whole range of um, documentation that you need on an archaeological site. So that's what we do in London, and we involve uh, other partners who uh, are historic England, for example, and Alexander is here, um, have been very helpful and very generous uh, with their time in, in our program. Uh, we have a whole variety of tutors that uh, give their time, sometimes completely free of charge. Uh, to help with this very beneficial training program. But when it's over in London, we don't kind of cut them loose and say, right, go back to Iraq now and put it into action. No. What we do, which I think is, is unique, is we then follow up our training with field work in Iraq. And we have established two excavation projects in Iraq, one in the south, uh, in uh, uh, southern Iraq and one in Iraqi Kurdistan north. And there our participants are able to put into practice what they've learned in theory. And this really is at the point where uh, our teaching, if you like, soaks in. But doing it actually yourself, it actually means something. And at the end of this process, these people are capable of actually going and directing a fieldwork operation all by themselves. So 
And they're not just, these are not kind of, you know, we could have a sandwich in the middle of Russell Square. Well, actually, we probably couldn't. But uh, we, these are not just training excavations. These are fully fledged research projects at major sites of international significance. And you'll see that in a moment. In the north, uh, John McGuinness is working at um, Dabandi Rania near uh, Lake Dokan uh, at an incredible site which is right on the kind of the border between the, uh, uh, the Hellenistic and the Parthian spheres of influence uh, and has produced some remarkable uh, results there. That's a view of, uh, of the area around uh, Lake Dokan. Um, uh, Kalaka Daban is the most extensively excavated site, and the participants contribute to every aspect of this excavation project. They don't just go out and hold a rubber bucket. They are actually involved in the field work, in supervising the work, in doing the surveying, the photography, drawing of the finds, uh, registration, you name it, they do it, and they contribute to the written reports. So really from beginning to end, they're involved 100%. And there they are, uh, actually on the site. You can see it's not far from the lake site uh, itself. This is a, a very important building, you can probably see it there, um, which is, it seems to be a type of fortress uh, of the Parthian period with a later Sasanian phase on top. But on the bottom you can see that our teaching doesn't stop with the end of the working day on site. Uh, that classroom style teaching carries on in the afternoons and evenings um, and it makes a, p a pretty demanding course I have to say. So these are just uh, a couple of the uh, lady participants we were very keen right from the beginning to make sure that there was a good balance between men and women on this project and we insisted that we would have uh, equal representation. We were able to negotiate that with the state board so we've had both men groups and women groups. Uh, we can't really mix them for a whole variety of cultural reasons as you might well understand but it's worked out terribly well. So this is one of the, the groups here and some of the finds that they were responsible for. Wonderful classical style statue there which had a lot of pigmentation on it, which has been uh, analysed. Um, there is a, a, a more uh, developed stage of the excavation of that fortress, another arm which actually uh, turned out to come from the same statue, which was rather nice, and a Sasanian coin on the top left. And here are people getting to grips with the surveying process using, you know, the old-fashioned kind of dumpy levels that we all grew up with. Well, not some of you. Uh, um, and there the uh, multi-station uh, doing its job uh, on the right-hand side there. By the time they finish this course, they know how to use this equipment. And that's a real asset when it comes to some of the sites that have been very badly damaged in Iraq, whether well, north or south. So here we are again just showing some of the uh, participants getting to grips here with uh, uh, retrieving finds from the excavation. In the south we have perhaps an even more famous site uh, that we are dealing with and that is the site of Tello, ancient Girsu. This was a site that defined Sumerian archaeology uh, in the 19th <coughs> century, uh, excavated by a series of uh, uh, French uh, scholars up until I think 1930 or thereabouts, but then the site largely abandoned until it was um, uh, re-excavated initially by Sebastian Ray before he came to the British Museum. So when he came to the end, he brought this wonderful site with him. Uh, which has proved to be one of the most exciting sites uh, that I've actually encountered. Um, that's a sort of an aerial view of the site. It's very, very extensive. It's a huge site composed of many different mounds, um, all on one base, if you see what I mean. And to remind you uh, that its most famous king, I'm sure um, you will have seen uh, at the British Museum, uh, King Gudea, there is his statue standing in front of a caseful of Sumerian artifacts. 
So the main phase that Sebastian's been excavating has been in the third millennium BC, although he's recently come down on earlier um, uh, prehistoric materials. There is his team, it operates on a fairly large scale, which is appropriate for uh, the size of this site. The most remarkable thing he and the participants have been uncovering is the temple of the god uh, Nengirsu, uh, the most important temple at, uh, at uh, Girsu, Telo, partly excavated by the French, uh, but not completed, and certainly not understood by them. Uh, one of the most extraordinary things is, is there is a statue in the Louvre of uh, Gudea sitting there with a plan, a real plan, on his lap. And uh, Sebastian worked out that this plan was actually the plan of the building he was excavating at Tello. Not only that, but he worked out the metrics of the plan on the statue and it works with a logarithmic scale of seven, whatever that means. Uh, but it means that what he was able to do was to take the plan on the statue and transfer it to the ground. And he was able to predict where corners were, where various buttresses were, and so forth. And he was out five centimeters. And there you see excavations going on in that temple building. It is a remarkable building, chock full of these little cones, or quite big cones, about so big, uh, with an inscription all um, dedicated to uh, Gudea. There's one of those cones in the ground, a bit of um, uh, drone uh, activity going on there too, terribly useful now for overhead uh, photography. And there are some of the participants there, and you can see engaged in every activity there, even down to washing the pop shirts, uh, which was thrilling. And one of the most remarkable buildings of all at uh, Tello, this is the world's earliest bridge, dating to about 2800, 2600 BC, that sort of period. Those are the piers, if you like, um, and there was a canal going through the gap in the middle there, dividing the religious part of Giasu from the public part, the public buildings, the administrative buildings. And this building was partly and rather badly excavated in the 1930s and then left uh, to rot. And Sebastian revived it, re-excavated it, understood its function as a bridge, and then turned it into a project for restoration. Now, one of the things we do teach in the training program is the ethical use of restoration. And there are many questions around this. Do you actually say to your Iraqi colleagues, OK, uh, let's put um, Nimrud back as it was before ISIS? Now, Nimrud has suffered about 80% damage to his excavated remains. Are you going to spend millions, billions on doing that? Or are you going to say, well, actually, all of that's been recorded terribly well, photographed, drawn, whatever. <clears throat> I think we're going to put our money into digging a new area where we can present something new for potentially a tourist audience when they can never get tourists back to Iraq. So there are questions here. We're not guiding them. We're laying out the options for them. But this provided the opportunity to show in a very graphic way what is involved in a, a decision about restoration. How do we do it? Are we going to do it properly? Are we just going to bung some concrete in there? No, of course we're not. Uh, so here, he employed people to make mud bricks again in the traditional fashion. He brought in... Sorry, I was somebody from the World Monuments Fund who advised on the, uh, the lining, the bitumen lining of this. Uh, uh, oh, it's gone down. Have you turned me off, Clive? Yes. Oh. There you go. There you go. <coughs> it doesn't matter about the surround, does it? You can click on slideshow. Where is that? Oh. Mm. From current smokers. Okay, there we are again. Um, 
And so this is a proper exercise in, in restoration as a slow process and an expensive one. And that's one of the lessons, I think, and one of the reasons why we're doing this, to show that proper restoration is both time-consuming and expensive, and therefore will provide more options for our participants. So altogether, then, uh, we provide a whole range of activities for our participants, both in London and in the field. And at the end of it, we feel that they've had a fully rounded experience. And it has paid off. And I can tell you now that on the basis of our training program, several of our participants have been appointed to uh, senior positions within the State Board. Charged, for example, one of them charged with uh, the assessment of the site of uh, Nineveh and Nimrud, sites of Nineveh and Nimrud, and I think Hatra as well. Um, and another one uh, is now the, uh, in charge of the restoration of the Mosul Museum. So it has had a very, very positive impact, and I'm pleased to tell you that uh, DCMS have very recently agreed to a one-year extension uh, for the Iraq scheme to keep it going for another year until uh, there's another spending review where we'll see where we go beyond that. So that's the Iraq scheme for you. Thank you.